YouTube's feed. Yes. And I'll tell you when it's live. It's live Wonderful. now. I suppose whenever you're ready then, Steve. Yes, off we go. Well, I think we're all right, aren't we? Mm. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's lecture. Um, I hope you can all switch your phones off, because there's a £20 fine if anything rings during the, uh, <laughs> the proceedings. Um, but with that, you know, uh, welcome to everyone. Um, do we have any apologies for absence? No. No? Well, in that case, let's just go straight on uh, with you, Andrew. Can you give us the minutes of the last meeting, please? So, uh, yes. Uh, so if everyone can just make sure they're uh, muted as well. Um, so the minutes of the last, our last lecture was absolutely, fa the absolutely fantastic joint lecture with the Geological Society of London and the Paleontological Association back in November. Uh, we had a record attendance, uh, 54 on Zoom, 504 uh, via the live YouTube live stream. And since then we've had a uh, you know, very nearly um, 2,000 views in total on, on YouTube, so it's it's fantastic. We had a range of excellent questions uh, on all, all sorts of aspects of uh, vertebrate paleontology to do with dinosaurs, uh, from sort of academics and um, particularly a professor all the way in Chicago. And it was excellently attended all the way from Kazakhstan to uh, America to so South America and Australia as well. And uh, we had uh, Fiona Gill from the University of Leeds doing the vote of thanks. Um, and if the office are so happy with that? I shall continue with the further notices. So our next lecture will be February um, on Thursday the 18th of February. Uh, this will be given by Dr Hanny Hughes of Campbell School of Mines and this is to do with rocks that go bang. Uh, so gas outbursts, uh, well, how gas can build up in underground mines and how this can lead to sort of either catastrophic uh, rock failure and how, how we can use applied mineralogy to uh, prevent this from happening. And this is a joint lecture with the Mineralogical Association of Great Britain and Ireland and also the Applied Mineralogy Group. Our March lecture has just been announced. It's with Professor Martin Dade Robertson from the University of Newcastle. And this will be a very interesting lecture on how you can use biotechnology, uh, particularly sort of forms of mold and bacteria uh, in the built environment, um, either to, to build architectural, create architectural materials or, or to help around the house. So uh, I hope you all tune in for that one as well. We have a further notice, uh, it's the Young Persons Lecture Competition, so it's our local heat. Uh, this is being run by our younger members group. Entries are still open. Uh, the deadline is midnight, one minute to midnight on Friday, the 12th of February, 2021. If anyone is interested in, uh, if you're 28 and under and involved in a materials, uh, geological or engineering project, um, please do check out the link miningstitute.org forward slash events and then it's our joint events with IMMM. If you want further details uh, on the competition, please email me at ad2021 at cam.ac.uk. Uh, but we're still open for entries and be great uh, to see you there. Don't forget, you can follow us online or those who are watching uh, via YouTube as well. Um, I, we're on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and also via the website. We've also got an increasing number of uh, lectures available online from our joint lectures with sort of, uh, the Durham Student Societies, uh, Learned Societies across the, across the UK and our own very own excellent series of lectures. Our last one, uh, just a highlight, was one on the Hartnoot Colliery disaster of 1862, which was our memorial lecture for it last week. Um, don't forget the Institute, uh, despite we not being able to meet in person at the moment, we've still got plenty of lectures and conferences planned. Uh, we've got our uh, annual dinner. We'll, we'll hopefully it will be later this year, but we'll see. And um, we're, we're hopefully really we've postponed all the field trips until 2022. But do please consider getting involved and becoming a member if you aren't already. And you can uh, take part and hear more about our excellent and great events. And if you need any more convincing, you've got some excellent postnomials, discounts on field trips, uh, invitation to the annual dinner, and an opportunity to get involved with our events. So uh, if, if you're not already a member, please look at, check out our website forward slash membership and uh, send us an application as soon as you can. 
Now on to the, uh, David's lecture this evening, and I shall hand back to Steve. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was very, very good informative information you've given us there. And uh, I hope it strikes home with uh, some of the people who are watching on YouTube, perhaps, and they, they approach you to uh, look into membership. Thank you very much indeed. Well, here we are uh, to the main topic of this evening's talk. It's the uh, New Zealand Geology Mining and Narrow Gauge Railways by uh, Dr. David Bell, our own Dr. David Bell, uh, CNG, and he's uh, a member of the Materials, Minerals and Mining Institute. He's also a member of the North of England Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers, our very own. And of course, he is uh, Honourable Treasurer at the NEMI as well. Uh, now, a little bit about David. Um, having completed his education at Newcastle University, uh, David joined the Northeast area of the National Coal Board at the end of the 70s. He progressed through the planning department at many collieries and area headquarters before joining the technical department at the Northeast Group headquarters. His final job with British Coal was safety engineer at Ellington Colliery prior to its first closure. Training provided by British Coal Enterprise prepared him to become a network consultant, which he still pursues today. Prior to the lockdown, he regularly traveled to NATO bases across Europe, training staff on network management and security. His history, he joined the Institute of Mining Engineers as a student and attended NEMI meetings regularly at Neville Hall and Newcastle University. He was a president of the NEMI junior section and later National IME Junior Section President, and he became President of NEMI in 2007, uh, then subsequently took on the office of uh, Honourable Treasurer, to which he remains today. Quite, uh, quite a title and quite a wonderful thing for to do. So he's prepared this lecture tonight on New Zealand, geology, mining and uh, narrow gauge railway. So uh, I shall hand you over now to David uh, Bell. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, this is why I haven't changed over to me on the display. So let's see if I can change that. Well, just hope it's going to work OK. Um, kia ora. Uh, that's the welcome in uh, New Zealand. Have life, be healthy. Uh, and it's a sort of an informal greeting when you work with people. And found out that when I actually went and looked at all the things I wanted to cover, I'd given too long a title. Um, so it's kind of, there's too much material kind of really there. Uh, and so therefore, uh, I'm going to have to skim some of the information. I have kind of left, um, can you mute your microphone, please, if you've got a cough? Um, the, um, so we're looking at geology of New Zealand, which of course includes the fact that it's on the ring of fire. It's kind of uh, the joining of two tectonic plates. We're looking at some of the mining uh, kind of that's involved in kind of uh, New Zealand. And we're moving on to the fact that they, they don't use standard gauge railway, they use narrow gauge railway, but I think you'll find the, the last narrow gauge railway I show you will be quite interesting. Now, whether we have time for the, uh, the tourist tips uh, is debatable, uh, but I'll certainly put the slides up for five seconds so you can, uh, you can always kind of look, freeze the recording uh, and have a look at some things to be concerned about if you are going to New Zealand. Well, first of all, where is it? And you search in Google for uh, maps of New Zealand and you quite often end up with ones like this. It's a bit like the time when uh, the EU went and left Wales uh, off uh, when they were doing some publication. New Zealand constantly disappears off the map. Here we can see a map of the world that IKEA went and was selling a while ago. New Zealand missing uh, to the point where uh, kind of New Zealand's kind of uh, government put a joke web page on their system. So if you type in a page that doesn't exist on any of their servers, you get page not found, we're sorry, something is missing. Uh, and certainly um, the, as a, one of the links I've provided is of the New Zealand Prime Minister with one of their comedians saying it's actually a worldwide conspiracy so that tourists will only go as far as Australia. They all think that New Zealand is a myth. 
so quite often you find that in New Zealand and Australia, they use a different world map. They have New Zealand and Australia in the middle so that people know where they are. They can get an idea how far away they are from different places. We can see there, there's New Zealand in the middle, uh, just uh, kind of the right side of the date line. So Auckland is always the first city that's kind of brings in the new year. I had to try to find a chart that would show some sort of comparison between the UK and New Zealand for us to get a real feel for the differences between the two countries. And you can see that the UK is about 10% smaller uh, than um, New Zealand. We've got considerably more population. Those figures are from 2014. Um, it was the only way I could get comparative figures to be absolutely certain that they were kind of the same sort of information. And it's about 14 times as many people in the UK. And so in the UK, for every thousand people, we've got four square kilometers. Uh, for New Zealand, the 64 square kilometers. And we're going to see shortly that kind of some parts of New Zealand are just as congested as kind of any of the urban parts of the UK. So there's an awful lot of empty space in New Zealand. Uh, so they are roughly the same sort of size. And there you can see where I got that information from. So some key bits of information about New Zealand. I'll be using this uh, kind of plan of New Zealand uh, on the right hand side kind of through a lot of the slides and if I'm point talking about one of the places that isn't one of the major cities I'll typically have an arrow indicating kind of where in New Zealand we're talking about. Two main islands north and south uh, however uh, they did go through a transition originally South Island was this little small island down the bottom which is actually Stewart Island uh, and South Island, as it is now, uh, was called Middle Island. They decided that kind of really Stuart Island wasn't really kind of uh, big enough to warrant that importance. So it came off and we have North and South that we're used to now. There are more than 700 smaller islands, some of which are populated, some of which kind of are kind of owned by an individual and they have their kind of mansion there some lo at some location. The biggest city is Auckland up at the north, and that was the original capital uh, when it had just been kind of uh, Europeans were starting to uh, get involved in this area. And it is a sizable city. It is kind of urbanized. It's got motorways. It's kind of, uh, as you would expect, any international city to be. And it's got a huge commuter area. So about half the population of New Zealand, kind of, so 5.1 million is the 2021 estimate, about half the population of New Zealand is in commuting distance of Auckland. It's the business center, it's where kind of uh, the main airport is uh, for kind of all the different international destinations. Wellington and Christchurch is very much more restricted where you can fly from internationally. The capital is the third biggest, it's only 220,000. Um, and the rest of North Island has about 1.2 million, so about 25% of the population in the rest of the North Island. Christchurch is the second biggest city, it's the capital of uh, the South Island. And you can see here it's kind of just next to this little bump sticking out, which is uh, Banks Peninsula. Kind of named after kind of one of the uh, people that accompanied uh, Cook when he was exploring. South Island has got another quarter of the population, so about 1.2 million. So you can see there, South Island is slightly bigger than North Island, so there's a lot of empty space there. The main way of getting income for kind of uh, New Zealand is dairy products, uh, not so much meat. That changed dramatically when uh, the UK joined the EU and we could, could no longer give kind of preferential kind of uh, imports to New Zealand and Australia. And that dropped quite dramatically. And dairy products is now kind of the biggest part. 
particularly things like dried milk. Uh, China kind of imports an awful lot of dried milk from um, New Zealand. They, they categorize it as a premium product, a product to be trusted, and that needs fuel to dry it. Uh, and that's typically provided by coal. So it's one of the reasons why they still mine a lot of coal in New Zealand, not to generate power, uh, but to actually kind of for industrial purposes for processing. Minerals, there's a you know 2% aluminium, 2% oil, 1% gold, 1% other. Uh, and wool, it's kind of disappearing off. Kind of so little quiz here. How many million sheep are there on New Zealand? So the last slide, I'll give you the answer to that. So just going back up a touch, you can see there one of the big in income streams for New Zealand is tourism. Uh, and you'll see that as we go through how they will convert something into a tourist destination at the drop of a hat. Obviously, very, very badly affected at the moment with the way they've gone into lockdown, but very, very few cases of coronavirus in New Zealand. So there's a short history. Uh, it was the last habitable land to be settled by humans. And this was kind of Poly Polynesians who kind of uh, traveled uh, 1280 through to about 1350. They arrived, uh, they developed their own culture, the Maori culture that uh, we're possibly familiar with. First European was the Dutch explorer Abel Tasman, uh, and he sighted New Zealand, but he didn't really explore it. And that was back in 1642. The first person to really explore New Zealand was Cook uh, on his ship. Uh, 1769, he arrived, 1770, he left. And you can see there's a copy of the chart that he went and produced from all the measurements, all the soundings that he actually went and did. And comparing it to the one I've got next to it, you can see he did a fairly good job. There's two major mistakes. Down the bottom, you can see Stewart Island. He didn't actually explore the, um, the sea between and it, the Stewart Island and South Island, and therefore he thought they were, it was actually a peninsula. And then if you actually come further up to where Christchurch is, uh, and as you can see this, this location just here, you can see that he thought that Banks was uh, an island, you know, Banks Peninsula was actually an island as opposed to being kind of attached to the mainland. Uh, but apart from that, it was a fairly good effort in actually kind of mapping out what was there. Europeans started to arrive, whalers uh, kind of would land and process their kind of blubber and kind of uh, put it into casks and uh, kind of then before they headed back uh, to Europe. And the Maoris were finding they were having problems. Obviously their weapons were no match to the firearms kind of held by the Europeans. And the British managed to persuade the chiefs that they could protect them. And they signed the Treaty of Wangatangi uh, which declared British sovereignty over the islands, but you know, giving the, um, the Maori kind of some say on what actually happened. As with most of these agreements, it was kind of, and you can see from the fact they didn't store them particularly well. This is kind of one of the uh, copies of the Wangatage Agreement. Um, and they put it in a metal chest somewhere, it hardly ever looked at it, and it got attacked by vermin. New Zealand very quickly became a standalone colony because pre it was actually considered to be part of New South Wales, kind of in Australia uh, for administration purposes, but this soon separated off. Uh, and 20 odd years later, they moved the capital from Auckland to Wellington because South Island people were saying, well, it's far too far, you know, too, it's too far for us to go to Auckland. Uh, we should have our own capital. We should be a separate kind of entity. Uh, so by moving the capital down to Wellington, it was a lot more convenient for the South Island people uh, to go across and to keep it together. One interesting fact was New Zealand was the first nation to actually grant all women rights to vote. OK, it was a colony of the UK, but it, they decided they were allowed to kind of manage that side of their governance. They did, uh, only certain activities did they actually have come back to the UK for the UK parliament to decide things. 
They got a bit further separated in 1907 by becoming a dominion. And then after World War II, they gained full independence. They no longer had to kind of rely on the UK uh, for um, links to other countries. Now, if you're interested in this history, I can recommend uh, this huge museum in Wellington. Think of uh, kind of any of the, the big museums down in London and Tea Papa uh, matches it. It's a very, very good, you can see copies of uh, the Waitangi Agreement, you can see kind of uh, some of their uh, ships, you can see some of their buildings, and it tells you a lot of the story of, of New Zealand. You can spend a day there to do it justice. Let's move on to the meat of the course, of the uh, course, the paper, and let's go first of all into geology. And we need to know a little bit about tectonic plates, uh, so that because it, that gives us the kind of volcanic activity and the consequences of the movement of the tectonic plates, uh, earthquakes. And then just uh, kind of some interesting rocks that my daughter kind of went and showed me uh, kind of what the first year, first time we went to visit because she thought that I'd be interested in them. And they are, they are very interesting kind of exhibits that you see in very few other places. So, New Zealand is on the boundary between the Australian and the Pacific tectonic plates, and it's part of the Pacific Ring of Fire. They're being pushed towards each other, and it's formed New Zealand. The mountain ranges wouldn't, wouldn't exist on New Zealand if it hadn't been for this tectonic activity. Looking at North Island first, you can see in the diagram we've got 47 millimetres per year, of movement towards uh, kind of the North Island. And this is referred to as subduction as that uh, Pacific plate goes underneath the Australian plate. So it's, it's off land, so therefore you kind of haven't got a kind of a, but it's fairly close as you can see there. South of South Island is going the other way. So the Australian plate is pushing down under the Pacific plate. They think so, because obviously kind of the depth of the water there can't see quite so clearly what's going on. But in between, they can't detect any subduction. Uh, the two plates meet at a major fault, which is the Alpine fault, which runs up uh, the west side of South Island. And they're sliding past each other. And you can see this movement there of kind of 40, roughly 40 millimeters a year. Now, the trouble is that that doesn't happen all the time. If it was constantly going past at 40 millimeters, uh, there'd be kind of a little slot in the road or whatever, and it would be just moving gradually. There wouldn't be the earthquakes, it sticks. And then all of a sudden you get a meter of movement or two meters, and this is, causes the earthquakes, uh, which obviously kind of can cause major problems. So the rocks along that boundary become more and more stressed until eventually they slip. And this is a dramatic occasion and there's a lot of energy released, considerable amounts of energy released at this particular time. There's a very nice YouTube video, which I've kind of shown at the bottom of the page there, if you want to see an animation of how the tectonic plates have moved to bring kind of New Zealand uh, into existence. So this movement uh, and the weakness we've got between those two tectonic plates has resulted in volcanic activity of different types. So it can be fairly benign, kind of hot springs, mud pools, and some terraces. We'll have a look at that. Um, we've got in Auckland Bay, there is an island that is formed purely of ash being thrown out by a volcano. Uh, that's uh, Rangi, Rangi, Rangi Toto uh, Island. I'm not very good at pronouncing uh, Maori names. I've tried to get a bit of a tutorial for my daughter. Hopefully I'll manage reasonably well. And then there's more dramatic activity. So in 1886, we had Mount Tarawera, uh, which destroyed the um, terraces that we'll be looking at first. And then a very much more recent occurrence was White Island. And 
I think I may have forgotten to put those slides in, but we can certainly talk about it. We'll move on to earthquakes and unusual rock formations a little bit later. So hot springs. There are numerous locations in North Island and South Island where you can find hot springs. Um, and these are often converted into uh, kind of tourist uh, hot spots to go with the hot water. Uh, in one particular case, Hamna, uh, the local community bought the hot pools so that no one individual would own them, gifted them to the local council so the, the local council would be able to kind of um, commercialize them, generate revenue, which would then benefit the hoteliers, the kind of shops in the, the Hamna Springs uh, kind of location. So this is a year round popular center. There you can see it in winter and you can see the steam there is warm enough to actually kind of uh, be swimming in there uh, all year round. Only a 90 minute drive away from Christchurch, so a very popular location. And you can see on the diagram here, Hamna Springs, that's about 90 minutes to drive. Now, I'll be in my tips. I do warn you about the fact that the roads in New Zealand, apart from around Auckland, are a bit more basic uh, than you would expect kind of uh, in the country uh, of that sort of sophistication. Uh, think of the A1 north of Berwick uh, and that's what the main roads are like kind of uh, in New Zealand. Another location which I've been to is the Hot Water Beach and this is up in Coromanda so it's up kind of this top location just up here and the hot water spring is coming up uh, through the actual beach itself. And so at low tide, you can dig a hole and you can have your own jacuzzi. Now, one of the recommendations in my tips that you don't go to New Zealand uh, in January. That is when they have their summer holidays. The schools are closed. Uh, so from Christmas through to the end of January is kind of school holidays. And therefore you'll find that kind of that hot water beach would be very much like this, uh, kind of with a whole crowd of people kind of uh, digging holes in the beach. So I would suggest you avoid that. Beautiful place to swim, by the way, because the, the heat is transmitted into the sea out there and you can be kind of out swimming for two hours and you're not coming out kind of all wrinkled and uh, kind of it's uh, just you really keep quite warm out there. Great place to swim. Other locations, this is Rotorua and it is kind of a very popular location because there's lots of things to see in this other location here. Uh, in addition to the uh, mud pools which are bubbling away, you can see there there's a little blob of mud being projected outwards here. There's in other locations, there's geysers and you can just look at the mud or turn it into a, into a tourist attraction. They turn it into a spa and they can promote the, uh, the, the muds as being kind of good for the skin. Not one that I think I'll do again, but uh, it's sort of uh, quite nice once to see it. Now the terraces, we can't see anymore. Uh, these are the white and pink terraces of Rotomaharana. Uh, this was the Victorian tourist trail uh, visitors to New Zealand. You had to be adventurous. You had to kind of get on a horse or get on a, uh, a donkey to kind of get to this location. There wasn't a road to take a wagon to uh, this particular location. And it was promoted as the eighth wonder of the world. So over the years, boiling hot geysers at the top uh, kind of the, the volcano, uh, the water had kind of waterfall down the hillside. It had evaporated and it had created these kind of pools uh, in steps kind of going up. And so the water got cooler as you came down so you could choose the particular heat of water you wanted. One of these was one set was pink, one set was white, and therefore the pink, white and pink terraces uh, of Rotoman. Mahana. However, they were destroyed 10th of June 1886 by volcanic eruption, which has resulted in yet another tourist attraction, which we'll describe shortly. 
So we have Lieutenant Herbert Mead. To convey an idea of its beauty on paper is impossible. Well, we've got a picture of the white one, we've got a picture of the pink one, but the pink one's been colorized by hand because obviously in those days we didn't have color photography. So you cannot really convey the idea. Those are just interpretations of what we think they were like. Now, the first time we went to New Zealand, uh, we arrived at Auckland. Um, we kind of decided to stay there a couple of days before we kind of moved on to Christchurch. And we went for a day trip out to Ran Rangitoto Island, which is in Auckland Bay. It's only a short ferry ride. The, the ferry does a sort of a little triangular trip uh, from downtown Auckland kind of out directly to the uh, island or it will go to Devonport first, pick some people up and then take them on uh, to uh, the island. It's the youngest of Auckland's 48 volcanoes. It's only about 600 years old. Uh, kind of, this is kind of being, is, they know about it from kind of uh, reports from um, the Maoris uh, about it appearing, uh, but also from the, the geological information that's available to them uh, from the samples they've taken. It's a small island, 5.5 kilometers wide, symmetrical cone, it's 260 meters high, uh, it was initially formed with liquid lava, which cooled down, and the later part of the eruption was dry kind of ash, kind of uh, volcanic ash. And originally, it would have been completely black. Now, wind would blow kind of dust across, birds would fly over and drop things onto it, and over a period of time, kind of this kind of... Um, uh, wildlife has started to come across and kind of colonate it, and trees have started to grow in this location, kind of from the, the, the kind of dust particles that have formed soil over hundreds of years. Uh, so here's a, a plan of the island. If you can take the trip across, you're then entitled to have a little kind of ride in a buggy, and they take you up to near the top. You can walk around. You can. We decided to walk back. Regretted it because it was very hot. Uh, this was February, the first time we went. It was very, very hot up there. We kind of suffered uh, a little bit. Uh, there is an island adjacent, and there's a bit of a causeway across, and that was used as a penal colony. And so to actually put create these roads uh, to kind of where they kind of created wharfs, you can see there was a World War II mine base, uh, they used kind of penal labor uh, to actually create uh, that. Oops. That made the let's so it's the next slide on sorry and we talk about it so there are a number of lava tubes if i just go back to that previous slide let's see if i can manage to do that yes you can just see on the plan here they say lava caves and these are lava tubes it's when there was a flow of lava the outer layer would solidify because of the cold things it was against, the kind of whether it was raining or kind of whether it was the cold ground. And you got a kind of a, a tube and you can now go through it. That is, a, you, you can crawl through there. You can sort of go to uh, that location. Um, it's the longest known one is about 50 meters long. We didn't know about them. So we hadn't taken the torch uh, and therefore, and you have to be self-sufficient visiting this island. There are no shops. You have to take your own water with you uh, to, and you need to take a lot of water. Uh, it is quite exposed. And from the late 19th century, this has been protected uh, as a recreational kind of reserve. And some people took advantage of this and uh, kind of, the, they went and built holiday homes. Now in New Zealand, they refer to a kind of a small shack for a bachelor as a batch. Uh, they pronounce it with a T, but it's kind of, it's a shortening of bachelor. So it's a bachelor pad somewhere in the country. Um, and there's a lot of these about. You'll find that if you want to rent a cheap accommodation in New Zealand, you don't go for the hotels, you look for batches. Uh, and some of them can be very, very nicely equipped indeed. So they built 140 of these. They, they realized that this was kind of uh, causing problems with pets being brought onto the island. They wanted to preserve it as being native New Zealand. And so they actually kind of 
decided to kind of kill off all the foreign uh, creatures on the, the location. Uh, so 2011, all non-native species have been eradicated. So it's effectively a bird sanctuary. There's no rats, cats, dogs, anything like that on the island. Um, unfortunately, I, the photograph, I, we went too late to see these uh, New Zealand Christmas trees at their best. So my photographs are nowhere good as this one here, but I couldn't actually find one that was actually taken on Rang, Rangitoto. And this is referred to as the New Zealand Christmas tree because it's had the red flowers on it, uh, the red plumage uh, at Christmas time in the middle of their summer. So moving on to Mount Tarawera. So this is where we had the pink and white terraces that I mentioned before uh, near Rotanga, Rotorua, sorry, Rotorua. And shortly after midnight, series of earthquakes and there was an, an eruption that produced volcanic material that spread for six kilometers. Two cubic kilometers of material was erupted. The eruption was so loud it could be heard and Blenheim, which is at the north end of South Island. The pink and white terraces appear to have been obliterated, but they have actually discovered them. They used a little submarine craft. They were able to find them in the lake that was at the bottom of uh, the volcano. And the New Zealand history site has quite a good description of what this sort of uh, went on here. The lava flowed, caused great destruction. There was loss of life, Maori and European communities. Uh, eight kilometers away, uh, there was the Te Warao, so Weiroa village, which was buried, though some huts did survive. So some of the Maori huts survived, the European huts uh, didn't. And Guide Sophia, uh, she had 60 people kind of inside her hut. And you can see there all the lava, you can see the uh, uh, volcanic material that's kind of piled up around it. and this is now an archaeological dig. It's an active archaeological dig, and it's referred to as the Buried Village. And you can help it by kind of having a look around. You can pay the entrance fee, and you can kind of contribute towards the work they're doing. And they've extracted kind of uh, various div, um, artifacts that were kind of relevant to the times. So you get a feel for what it was like to be uh, kind of somebody as a, a an early colonist of New Zealand. Um, yes, I've missed that one on time. So earthquakes. So a book published in 1915, Old Fang, Fanganui, you pronounce WH as a sort of sound. So Fanganui, Nuni. So that New, Maoris said that Rune Fenua which was the shaking of the land, were less frequent and less violent before Europeans arrived. Uh, they described two severe earthquakes uh, at Tapo and Rotorua. And as it said at Rotorua, the settlement was swallowed up and the area became a lake. Uh, the Maori also report major changes to the landscape of Wellington. Um, and skipping quickly forward, uh, when Captain James Cook explored this area in 1773, there was only one harbour entrance. But from the work they've done, they realised what's happened is that this kind of, whoops, go back. This area here used to be a channel. So it kind of, this was a sort of a, a half moon shape kind of over here. This all, when the earthquake took place, uh, kind of the lift took uh, lifted up, and then this you could walk across this kind of piece here, and it very quickly filled up. And so Wellington Harbour only has a single entrance now. There's been significant earthquakes taking place on a, on a regular basis, and for most part, if they are low energy, they're good news. It basically means that there's less chance of a big earthquake coming along. Uh, if you have uh, kind of the smaller earthquakes, a bit of shaking, 
and my daughter uh, kind of regularly reports the fact that kind of there's been a shake last night or we were out camping somewhere and we kind of felt a bit of movement taking place. But there has been a number of serious earthquakes taking place and I'm just going to focus on a couple of these. So first of all, Hawke's Bay. And uh, there was two towns at the time, kind of Napier, we now think of it as uh, being a city. I think Hastings might be a city now as well. Um, and the Europeans purchased land from the Maori. They paid for the land. 1851 is when this was bought. All the initial kind of buildings were timber. But by 1931, many buildings were built of brick, including um, the Anglican Cathedral, Municipal Theatre. People started to become concerned as early as 1902 that brick buildings were not a good idea when we were having earthquakes. Would they be able to withstand an earthquake? And in 1900, it was common to start using concrete. So the Boys High School, the Presbyterian Church, reinforced concrete tie beams, and the Hawke's Bay County Council building was made from concrete. Hastings started about 20 years later, very much more residential, had few civic buildings, but they still had a five story brick hotel, the Grand Hotel shown there, and that was Hawke's Bay's tallest building. So you can see here on the North Island, there's Hawke's Bay. 3rd of February 1931, 10.47 uh, a.m., uh, it lasted two and a half minutes. Wooden buildings were generally okay, apart from the fact that chimneys were brick built, the chimneys would typically collapse and they would come through the building and damage it. First day of school, they were very, very lucky that children were still outside as they were sorting out which children were going into which classroom. In particular, the boys high school, one of the children in his kind of diary described the new assembly hall like a deck of cards, each wall fell in and then the tiled roof came down and they'd just been in there. Uh, it was kind of the break had come along, they'd gone out and then the earthquake took place. And that's a picture there of the new assembly hall for the school. Liquification took place and we'll describe this a little bit later on, but you can see there the, the road uh, here disintegrated and vehicles were falling inside. Most timber buildings were okay, but unfortunately this one kind of uh, behind the one at the front, you can see how the chimneys kind of collapsed on this one here, uh, but then the one behind is jumped off uh, the uh, supports, the brick pillar supports that they had to keep them away from the termites, kind of wooden buildings would get eaten by the local uh, grubs otherwise. Uh, it jumped off and collapsed in that particular fashion. But otherwise, most timber buildings were fine uh, in Hawke's Bay. In the business centre of Napier and Hastings, there were many fatalities and the worst damage was caused by the collapse of the masonry buildings or if steel beams had not been put in correctly so they were unsecured. And they, they did a lot of investigation afterwards and they discovered that a lot of buildings were not following the standards that they should have been and this led to kind of uh, enforcing the standards uh, in the, from 1931, the building standards were more rigorously controlled. There was also things like ornamental features would fall through the roofs off the front of the building. So the actual kind of concrete building would be okay, but the false front would collapse into the street as was shown here. The new concrete buildings, they generally survive quite well and the old wooden buildings, as you can see here, we've got a street and we can still see the wooden buildings kind of standing perfectly okay. Now, the chemists were doing whatever they do with um, chemicals. They were using Bunsen burners and they stayed lit. And so they, they thought that uh, there was a number of chemist shops with a source of fires in both uh, Napier and in Hastings. In Hastings, the water supplies were still okay. Firefighters were able to uh, contain the fire, apart from the Grand Hotel. In Napier, they had a big reservoir, which was the other size of this gorge. 
and they had a, a road bridge across and underneath the road bridge was the water pipe. So they lost the water pipe, they lost the water supply and the fire brigade had nothing they could use to fight the fires. They put fire engines onto the beach, they clogged up because the bay had lifted. Uh, they kind of, uh, what had been a kind of a, a quite a large harbor area disappeared because of the movements of the underlying strata. Luckily, there was a Navy ship moored uh, at kind of uh, adjacent to Napier. And they went and uh, kind of shortly after the earthquake, they went and radioed that the whole town appeared to be on fire. And then 10 minutes, they deployed rescue teams and they were a big help to the local community. So after the fire, you can see the devastation that was left in Napier. So there we can see a, a party of the naval people helping, uh, trying to find people uh, trapped in the buildings. If your house was okay, you still had a problem, no electricity, no water, no sewerage, no chimneys. And so therefore they evacuated the wounded, uh, women and children, they evacuated as well. Able-bodied men were told to stay to help with the rebuilding, with the kind of searching for people trapped uh, and things like that. So they left by car, uh, some ships took them away. Uh, it took a little while for the track to be repaired before they could, trains could also take people away. Um, they kind of used the trains at slow speed to get people out. So rebuilding Napier, within 14 days, and I just kind of try to think kind of um, in Britain nowadays, would got the government kind of react within 14 days? They took the decision to ban rebuilding damaged buildings and the erecting any temporary premises because they wanted to clear the debris and plan a new town. And so they created what was referred to as Tin Town. Uh, on Memorial Square. So 50 businesses for two years. And then they started clearing the rest of the location. Now, they delegated management to two commissioners who consulted with a committee formed of 13 volunteers. Uh, benevolent dictatorship was one of the phrases that was sometimes used. And they decided to be to kind of go for the broad brush approach. They widened the streets. They decided they were no longer going to allow power and phones to be on poles. Everything was going to be underground. And they decided that the architects were going to cooperate and have a standardized building frontage so everything would match with each other. The land had moved, therefore the survey marks were no longer in the right place. And because of the fires, a lot of title documents had been destroyed. So they gave people you know, a six month temporary certificate saying, well, that's your plot of land. It may be slightly different position, but that's where it is now. And after six months, they kind of finalized those kind of any protests, they would then resolve those in the courts. So we had the four arch architects working together. Art Deco was the, pro uh, was the was Williams one, but it was very popular with other people as well. There was Spanish Mission, which had a similar similar kind of modern uh, feel to it. Uh, there was also somebody who liked American architect and bought a lot of his buildings on his. And then somebody else was into arch windows, but again, very, very simple. Because concrete, you don't want to have embellishments. You want to keep it quite simple. And the architects were encouraged to use riveted metal frameworks, not welding it, riveted to make noise so people could hear the city being rebuilt. Uh, and kind of, there we are. So by 15 months after the earthquake, 19 new shops were ready for occupation. One month later, they'd completed 129 of which 108 were occupied. And so Tin Town, they demolished it in stages as the various different firms moved back. Now the firms took a lot of pride in their new buildings, decorated them carefully, had photographs taken, and it, it became a bit of a tourist attraction. You can see here, this is a, a shopping, the opening of shopping week. The first, it was, had a parade, 
uh, and kind of people came from long distances around to see what the new environment that had been built. And one of the things that commentators talked about was the fact that not having the power cables, not having the telephone cables, how less cluttered it was, how clean and modern it was. So there were other styles, but Art Deco City was the sort of the way it was promoted. However, by the 1970s, it was old fashioned, lost pride in itself. And there was a visit by OECD, uh, that's the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. These planners and architects enthused over the Art Deco. And um, the, the New Zealand Ministry of Works and Development, they decided to sponsor a book, promoted a film, and they realized that they had something that they could promote to the rest of the world, that people wanted to come and see this kind of city set back in time. Uh, and they realized there wasn't sufficient protection, so they had a, a nice building like this, the Norwich Union Insurance, and it was demolished in 1983. There was no protection because it wasn't important enough being a young building. They formed a trust, and this uh, in 1985, they published walking guides to help visitors explore the city um, and encourage the businesses to take pride in their buildings, to restore them to their former glory. And they, you know, an office block, you, could, you can take the walking tour and the visitor can go and look inside because they, they've negotiated that access so people could look at the interiors, which often were in Art Deco. Published three books, and these three books kind of um, will be available in the Mining Institute Library if anybody wants to have a look about Napier. Now Christchurch, this is on South Island. It's kind of the blue circle in the middle here. And British settlers, they purchased a vast amount of South Island. The Maoris kind of were mainly concerned about North Island. Uh, South Island kind of wasn't that populated as far as they were concerned. And they, they bought kind of the almost kind of 20% uh, uh, of the kind of the top east, the kind of northeast part uh, of the South Island, and that's Canterbury region. And there was going to be the agricultural area. A lot of the other areas were going to be mining. This was going to be agricultural. They built Christchurch to be their seat of government, uh, just north of Banks Peninsula. And they went and named things after kind of things they were familiar with. So poets, towns in the UK, um, Manchester Street is one of the ones that's kind of uh, just in this sort of area over here. Um, grid pattern, nicely organized, uh, big park uh, for recreation. This is where they play the cricket, by the way. They still kind of have this area here uh, is where their cricket ground is. So the largest city on South Island, second largest city in New Zealand. It developed a large commercial center, manufacturing, industrial development built up on the outskirts. And the University of Canterbury was founded in 1873 and it's New Zealand's second oldest. And here we can see uh, one of the buildings before they moved out. And they handed this over to the Christchurch Arts Center. Christchurch suffered two earthquakes. The first one, 4.35 a.m., 4th September 2010. And this was some distance away, 40 kilometers, kilometers away. It was a high magnitude, 7.1. And they never, they didn't know there was a fault in that location. There's a deep layer of sediment all the way across the Canterbury Plains. And it completely hid. There'd been no movement on this fault for thousands of years, and therefore there was no signs whatsoever for them to be concerned. But because it was in early hours, and people were in their residential property, mostly timber built, very few casualties. Still three billion dollars worth of insurance claims. You know, the New Zealand Building Code is kind of very, very strong. Uh, modern buildings are designed to be earthquake proof, but by preserving life rather than keeping the, you know, things are designed to fail safely. 
uh, as far as possible. Residential property, timber framed, and it can cope. Older masonry buildings, these were affected. Uh, and this particular home, this lady, uh, brick built, close to the epicenter, and thankfully uh, she wasn't hurt when the rest of her house was destroyed. The, in Christchurch itself, they had power cuts affecting 75% of the city, but they managed to restore it. They did get some contamination in the water supply and uh, soil liquefaction took place. Now, this is a very kind of interesting thing that takes place. And it's because of the fact that is sediment that Christchurch is built on. So you have your water table, you have your dry soil at the top, but when you start to shake it, the water rises. It turns the kind of underlying soil into mud and things like pipes that are empty, they float on that kind of liquid layer that's created and they lift up. And you can see here, that's obviously, you know, you can see that manhole cover used to be obviously at road level, but because the um, tubes have lifted, it's kind of poked out the top. And you see kind of, uh, there was examples of this taking place um, where the tarmac would break up and cars would drop through into the liquefied, la liquefied layer below. Historic buildings, older, not built to current code, and a number were damaged. You can see this one is the Oxford Terrace Baptist Church. They propped the front up and the government very quickly offered uh, kind of grants towards the restoration of these buildings. Now, aftershocks were, were continually taking place. There might be kind of hundreds of shocks taking place one day, fairly low. There might be, you know, 5.1 is a fairly strong earthquake. Uh, and it twice took place, 5.1, 5.0, 4.9. And there was minor damage taking place whilst this was happening. The second earthquake, that's the one that caused the major dam damage. In particular, it was 1251. So therefore, it's the middle of the day, people were in the business centers. Uh, the hypercenter, which is the, the new phrase they use for the epicenter that I was kind of educated on, it was only five kilometers deep and it was only 6.7 kilometers southeast of the city center. Not as strong, 6.3 magnitude, and it's technically referred to as an aftershock. And closer in both senses, the devastation was considerably worse. City center was a ruin. So the majority of the Gothic stone buildings had fallen. Even two modern buildings had collapsed and office blocks, terrible results. So here we can see the Christchurch Anglican Cathedral. The, and this was the day after the second earthquake. Uh, there had been a number of smaller earthquakes kind of back in you know, 1933 and earlier, uh, which had damaged the tower, but um, it, this one dropped it. It also did a lot of damage to the end wall that's closest where that rose stained glass window is. They went and erected some steel work to protect it. And then subsequent aftershocks, you know, caused that steel work that was trying to protect the end wall to actually destroy it. They built a temporary cathedral. Uh, this is referred to as the cardboard cathedral because the wooden roof beams are held in, in a bundle inside those huge cardboard tubes. Um, and I visited this. And the lady told me a story about uh, the uh, cathedral. Uh, and I, my research for this paper, I discovered that she was actually talking about the Methodist church. Uh, kind of her stories didn't actually tie in. So always be careful with volunteer stories. Um, they can have issues. Now, the lubrication was considerably worse in some areas during that second earthquake. And they went and fenced off the houses. The, they didn't know whether the houses were going to stand or were going to collapse because of the fact that all the foundations had been completely shook up. 
it wasn't going to be economic to kind of remake all the roads, put all the services in, um, and people would not be able to get insurance because of the fact that kind of their land effectively had no value. And so they're converting these areas now into the council are buying the land off the people. The people are claiming on the insurance on the building and they're building new properties elsewhere. And this is all being converted into kind of parkland. There we can see that's the shot photograph I showed you the uh, Oxford Terrace Baptist Church after the first earthquake. And you can see how it was totally destroyed in the second earthquake. Now here we have a modern building built to earthquake codes. And surprisingly, there wasn't a single pane of glass broken. The foundations, the insulation, the kind of isolation that they built into the system worked. The only trouble was liquid, I no, can't say the word, can I? Liquidification took place and it caused this 33,000 ton building to twist. 182 millimeters, you know, six feet, two yards of sinkage took place. Now, it took them a while to plan what they were going to do, do but when they actually started doing it, they managed to jack the building back level again in 52 days. Whilst it was actually tipping, they actually used it. Um, one of the disaster recovery teams was based kind of in this building um, with all the kind of, but all the uh, um, art items, none of them had been damaged. Here we can see the University of Canterbury building and it became quite severely damaged. It took many, many years. They went in and had to reinforce it. It was still like this when I visited kind of six years ago, uh, this kind of steel supports on it. Uh, but it's only in my last visit, they kind of have started to take these supports away uh, and it's kind of the building starting to become occupied again, it's taken 10 years to kind of rebuild a heritage building like this. Now, Christchurch had their own tin, tin town. That's a typo, they have to correct that. So tin town, they called it Restart. And because they had a red zone in the shopping district, but this was a temporary kind of red zone whilst the buildings were unsafe, they put all these containers together and they created a new shopping complex. Uh, and that kind of lasted quite a few years. It was certainly very, very active five years ago when we went. And the Quake City, uh, this is a, a kind of museum they put together where they've taken artifacts that have come off buildings and the buildings no longer exist. So they've kind of, there's nowhere for them to go. Uh, they've also got exhibits that show you how liquefaction took place. They have kind of interviews with uh, the people who suffered the earthquake, but also the people who came to help with the rescue. Um, and in conjunction with the local newspaper that can kind of publish this book. And this again will be in the library uh, for people to have access to, uh, to kind of find out. It's kind of really quite kind of um, a story, kind of the people that came from all over the world, that came from the UK, uh, Australia, and the United States. There was numerous pe people coming from all locations. Now I'm realizing that I'm actually overrunning quite dramatically. So I think possibly what we might do is kind of call it a day at the end of my geological, geological, geological section. Uh, I might give you the tips at the end and we can then think about having another paper some other time about the railways uh, and the mining. Um, but just some unusual rock formations. Uh, the pancake rocks, uh, this is Poon Akeki. Um, this is limestone. And there's layers of hard and soft limestone uh, formed by something called stylo bedding. So the idea is that the limestone was formed uh, about a kilometer below the seabed. You had the pressure of the rocks at above, you had the hydraulic pressure being less, and therefore water was being flushed out and it took some of the material out and it, it created soft layers in between the hard layers. And so you can see how the rocks kind of have eroded in this particular fashion. So quite a tourist interaction here. They also had kind of um, kind of caves 
uh, would kind of have a roof fall and therefore when the sea came come up at high tide, uh, particularly if there's a kind of strong winds blowing, that the wave would progress through the tunnel, get to the end and then be thrown up uh, at the end. So you get these sort of little plumes of water kind of covering you as, as you're going through this sort of area. The Moraki boulders, this is Koikeki uh, Ho Beach. Uh, mudstone cliffs suffering erosion by wave action. And they found these huge boulders, these spheres, gray spheres, up to 2.2 meters in diameter. Two thirds of them are over 1.5 meters. So you can you can stand on that and you can have something you're good sort of one and a, a meter off the, uh, the surface uh, of the sand there. Not you, you, there are some other places where they have them. And they are thought to have actually been formed in situ that you get a shell of calcite kind of for some reason deciding to kind of uh, encapsulate an area. You get large cracks, septateria, which are radiating from the hollow center of this boulder. And these cracks, they're filled with brown or yellow calcite. Uh, really quite fascinating seeing these objects. Now, quite close to this, uh, the, those boulders is a uh, glowworm worm cave. Never actually been inside the, uh, kind of the glowworms, but it is quite a big thing for New Zealand. And I like this one because of the fact it's got some quite nice geological features uh, in the caves. But there are numerous other uh, glowworm caves in New Zealand. There's, there's a list of 10 uh, just in that pocket guide uh, entry at the bottom there. So here you can see the stalactites and stalagmites formed from calcite in this particular cave uh, with the glowworms kind of inside it. The, the kind of these little grubs, uh, there's a sort of a chemical reaction taking place which for, makes them glow, which attracts insects, and they have sticky tendrils kind of hanging down, tangle up into the insects, and then they, they've got acts, they've got um, uh, a meal there for them. Uh, and you find this kind of throughout kind of different parts of New Zealand. Do People want me to carry on about mining. Uh, it's going to be because I'm going to be overrunning by about 15 minutes, I would think. Andrew, kind of, Steve, what do you want me to do? We have a show of hands for anyone who wants to uh, continue on. Anyone? I've, I've got one. Yes. Yes, yes. I think we can continue on for a few more minutes, David. Okay. So I've concentrated on the gold and the coal. Uh, first of all, gold. So this map shows the geological kind of um, locations. The red location here, this is where we've got volcanic flows have taken place. And inside the kind of quartz, we've got a lot of gold that can be a, a, a found. Uh, further down on South Island, you find there's a lot of alluvial uh, gold. So you can see a grey river, they're dredging it for it. And here you can see the quantities of gold that have been produced. So I'm, I'm going to look, uh, just have a little discussion about the history. So Coromandel School of Mines is kind of a, a useful bit of information there. And then I visited a working gold mine, uh, Wahi Gold Mine, which was up here in the Coromandel kind of location here. And then you can actually go panning for gold. Uh, it's legal, no uh, uh, license required. You just have to go there. So they found it as early as 1852. Um, and the alluvial deposits told them where it was. They then worked back to the rock. And then that's when the real mining started. So you've got small flecks of gold, quartz veins in the hard rock. And you have to mine the quartz, you have to crush it, and you then have to extract it. And so here we've got a stamper battery. There's three units in this particular one. On the next page, there's another picture of one. And this was too expensive for a kind of a simple miner to own. And so they would kind of take their rock along, 
it will be crushed for them and they would then sort of uh, get extract the gold kind of out of it. And so uh, there were uh, several very rich mines in this sort of area. Martha mine at Wahihi uh, is a prime example. And so over 11 tons of gold silver bullion because you find you, know, you actually get more silver than gold. Uh, the Wahi mine, they kind of talk about it being a silver mine that happens to produce gold uh, because the actual quantities of silver are dramatically more than the actual amount of gold they get. So they couldn't afford the stamper. Here you can see, I think something like 10, one, two, three, it must be 10 or 12 uh, stampers there, crush a lot more ore and you kind of, they, you'd pay them a percentage of the fee. So for the, very important for the mines to know how much gold they were going to get from the ore. So they could follow the best vein for the most return. Uh, and obviously, so they weren't cheated. So they went to school, uh, learned geology, mathematics, surveying, mineralogy, and very importantly, assaying. So they could assaying, so they could work out how much gold was in their kind of rock. Uh, and the schools to be able to kind of uh, fund themselves if you couldn't do it yourself, they one of their lecturers would do it for you and obviously charge you a fee for that. So numerous different uh, mines, mining schools were set up. Uh, Coromandel School of Mines was established uh, in 1887 in a town called Thames. And you cannot imagine a place that's more like a wild west town uh, with the fake fronts, wooden fronts in front of the buildings and the tiny little buildings behind. And you know, a lot of it still exists there. So they had a purpose built building here. This was actually on um, sacred ground to the Maori. And therefore you had to kind of show respect to the land and kind of wash your hands as you kind of enter onto it. And they still kind of have that respect as part of, of visiting this building. Guiding tour, guided tours, they've got models of various kind of bits of equipment to show the students what was involved and they taught them how to do as a saying. Now, any of these small sort of museums, important to check opening times because they tend to close during the winter. You might find it's only during the summer holiday season and the months either side that they could be open. So here you can see some, one of the models where you've got stamper, You've got a, a, a amalgam plate and amalgam, you know, mercury will kind of extract the gold out of your crushed rock, but it won't be 100%. It's only 50% successful. Um, over here, we've got a, a lump of, is this fool's gold? Is it valuable? Well, yes, it is actually called free gold because it's not uh, kind of chemically uh, contained in the media. Uh, it's, you know, it's easy to extract by crushing. So moving on to the Wahi gold mine, this was originally an underground mine, underground mine only. Uh, this was established quite early on, 1882. Uh, but they were successful because they were using a cyanide process that was invented by a Scots gentleman whose name is uh, I've lost from when I went and learned it yesterday. And you dramatically increased the amount of the amount of gold you could get. Therefore, you could work with lower grade ores. And because of the fact that this Martha mine was kind of being uh, so successful, this was the fastest growing town in Auckland. You know, it was a gold gold rush into this location. But the price of gold was fixed in the States, $35 per ounce. And therefore kind of, uh, you couldn't mine gold and expect to charge more than that if people could buy it from America at that price. It was uneconomic. The mine closed in 1950s. And kind of that's the entrance kind of uh, into the underground mine that they use at the Wahi gold mine now. So 1970s and 80s, Gold price was now floating, increased. And they identified the fact that if they went for an open cast mine, they would have a chance of actually uh, making a good profit. So the mine was reopened. The underground mine had kind of been pumping and had this kind of Cornish design tower. They moved it 300 meters. You're gonna see that they're gonna have to move it again shortly. 
So here is the way he got open cask mine. Uh, uh, probably the uh, about nine, uh, 2012, 2014, uh, something like that, because they had some landslips. They didn't realize there were some faults that were hidden behind uh, one of the uh, walls. Uh, high water table lubricated that fault and there was a slump. Uh, so that's a photograph I took during my visit. I'm surprised it's actually that good because the weather was terrible. Um, and it completely blocked the pathway down for the, the uh, vehicles. And there was property that was in use just beyond that wall. So there was no way they could go into the wall. Uh, they tried to repair it uh, April 2015, and then it just got worse. April 2016, large land sale. The underground mining did continue, and this is taking place. You can see there that the town surrounds it. It completely surrounds it. But the vast majority of those people work in the mine, and they actually pay compensation for vibration. Um, and so you can see, looking at, they've applied an overlay on top. The existing mine is sort of shown kind of, kind of about kind of that sort of area is the existing mine and they're planning to expand it and this will allow them to repair the uh, roadways down to the, the bottom and they will then be allowed to kind of mine this again. Now I understand they actually got permission for this but they were also applying for permission for opening another one, another mine in the vicinity on another node of uh, high grade ore. Now the city, the town round it like it because they get employed by it uh, they also get paid uh, if they uh, blast in the afternoon. They're only allowed to blast it kind of at lunchtime. They also get paid if the blasting's too strong, they make too much noise. There's all sorts of compensation to keep the local people happy. And the last little bit, um, panning is called fossicking in uh, New Zealand. And this is perfectly legal. You don't need a permit. Uh, you go to this location here and you find the various different sites where you're allowed to do it, all on South Island. So it's kind of this sort of area here on West Coast. It's the Tasman area up here. And there's a, a city here, a town, no, a city now called Nelson, which is a whole paper just by itself. Uh, and then down here is Ortego. So you can go along, get into the river, dig up uh, some gravel, and then by swishing it in the water or using a hand-driven uh, kind of sluice, uh, you try and separate the, the gold because it's heavier than the bedrock that's around it. And that's legal. Now on the coal side, um, thanks to Tony Foster for help with some of the details. And he also introduced me to hydro mining that uh, I've never had experience of uh, in the UK. So. New Zealand coal is much younger. It tends to be kind of lignite or brown coal, 80% uh, of it. However, the bituminous and the semi-bituminous coal, very low ash, and some seams as low as you know 1%. Uh, and there's 15 billion tons of, S of kind of reserves there. Uh, 18 open cast mines, 2.9 tons per year. Uh, in October 2017. All the uh, underground mines have closed. Uh, they're just not, for the type of material they're mining, kind of, um, they kind of, the underground mines are not cost effective anymore. So there's a number of zones here, uh, which are up. This one's kind of fairly self explanatory. I'll leave it on there for five seconds so you can look at it on the video. West Coast, this is where they were producing some very high quality coal, which is still in demand. Uh, so this kind of bituminous, bituminous coal, uh, high quality, low levels of mineral contaminants, contamination. It also kind of um, works very, very nicely kind of for making steel. Uh, so it's kind of that is still being produced there. However, some parts of this coal field have now been kind of included into the national park, so mining is no longer allowed. So the Maori 
were burning coal for cooking. The whalers were using coal for rendering bubbler. And this is just stuff they were picking up off the surface, you know, that would be exposed. And so over 1849, first European mine in Dun 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 Dunedin, which is down here. Uh, you may well have heard that name before with a, a kind of rugby or kind of cricket. Uh, 20 years, numerous spore mitts, but I think probably not much more than a bell pit. In 1870s, they were importing coal because they were, had trains to move supplies around. They had steamships were obviously coaling up to take the, the um, uh, meat back to the UK. They needed uh, coal to run the refrigeration plants so they could freeze the meat. And so there was, they heavily invested in mining. And by the 1900s, they were producing a million tons a year. And it was the main energy source. Now, this is an unusual technique. Um, and at first, they were just running water on, uh, they pumped water onto the coal face. They would blast the coal face down conventionally, and they would then use water to wash the coal into a pipe or a trough all the way out the mine. Uh, and then store at the storage bins at the railhead, which could be kind of a couple of kilometers away uh, from the actual mine itself. As the technique was developed, they had high pressure monitors, which would actually blast the coal out of the coal face. Uh, and so kind of, and again, you could then, so the high pressure water from the surface comes down, you then pump it up and then, so you were washing the coal at the same sort of process. As you'd expect, as in the UK, it was a protected um, job and open cast mines started to be developed. So you can see here, 1939, there was 2% open cast, 45, there was 16%. And the production stayed about the same, but more and more of it was being produced by open cast. There was decline in the 60s and 70s, but with oil prices rising, coal was revived. And we can see here this screen, this capture here is showing the kind of uh, the fact 2012, there was almost 5 million tons. It is dropping off now as North Island has uh, thermal kind of uh, techniques for generating power. South Island has hydroelectricity. Uh, and so therefore there's less and less demand uh, for electricity generation, but heating uh, for industrial purposes, for kind of, uh, process export for blast furnaces, key use of coal. Right, I'll just go forward to the tourist tips. I'll just put those on the screens for kind of five seconds so people can sort of freeze frame those ones. Uh, just a bit of advice about uh, one key thing, you now have to have a visa before you go to New Zealand. Um, two years ago, that wasn't the case. It is now. Um, car hire, quite cheap. Uh, I would sort of certainly recommend that, but do bear in mind the roads are slower. Um, they kind of they are very much more like the A1 kind of very little dual carriageway. And don't go in January. Uh, kind of you'll find that flights, accommodation, very much more expensive, and obviously the attractions will be very much more busy. Uh, and people don't expect you to tip. They have a, a minimum kind of a living wage rather than a minimum wage sort of uh, mentality there. And therefore, wait staff expect to kind of, uh, don't expect any tips at all, but it makes the food more expensive. Now, I just like to finish off with um, the fact that if you know somebody under 30 and they fancy going to New Zealand, they can get a working holiday visa, 12, 23 months. Uh, they've got to show that they can, they've got sufficient savings to live on, £175 a month. They can work uh, for 12 months and they can then holiday for the rest of the time. You cannot apply for a permanent job. However, you can apply for a temporary job provided it's reasonably paid. If they've got a skill shortage, your employee can then sponsor you to apply for residency. Res residency. And after a certain number of years, you can apply for citizenship. So you may have 
wonder why I've developed this interest in New Zealand and why I'm talking about this visa. Well, I'm well over 30. And it's because my daughter went out there six years ago with a British boyfriend, got temporary joys, jobs that were skilled and well paid. They were sponsored by their employers to become in residents. They got engaged, came back to the UK to get married, and they applied for citizenship. Bought a house in Christchurch uh, in an area that wasn't badly affected by the red zone problems. Started a family, and they're now building a granny flat in their garden. So why would they want to come back to the UK? And we have gained a holiday destination which we will always want to visit. And that's our main reason for going to New Zealand as often as we can. There they are watching the recent cricket uh, with our little one, Benjamin, kind of enjoying the cricket there. And the answer to the question, 26 million sheep now, compare that when we weren't in the EU, uh, New Zealand had 70 million sheep. So sorry I missed the railway section, but that can be a separate paper. Um. Well, that's absolutely wonderful, uh, David. Uh, very, very enjoyable. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we could get through everything, um, but then that will make an absolutely wonderful paper for a, a later event, which we're, I'm sure we're all looking forward to uh, with great anticipation. Um, we may have to change, I think, the, uh, the run here now. Uh, we would usually have questions now, um, but uh, the, we have run quite late, so I think it might be as well. So uh, call upon uh, Ian Cameron McIntosh to do the vote of thanks, and if anybody wants to hang on after that, uh, they can, uh, I'm sure David wouldn't mind hanging on for a little longer to answer some questions. That's so okay. Cameron McIntosh now. Because everyone had Hi, David. I've just got to say, I did think you were being employed by the New Zealand Tourist Board. <laughs> um, but I have to admit, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I would have liked a little bit more on the mining. And um, I'm sure Les would have loved some on the railways. Um, the only thing that really shocked me was the size of that open cast pit. I was a bit disappointed with that because I thought New Zealand was supposed to be beautiful in all wilderness and mountains and lakes. And I think Lord of the Rings has left me a little bit more to be expected. But um, I thoroughly enjoyed the talk. I think it was very interesting. I would definitely like to hear more about it. And I would like you to, to possibly do the one about the railways. But I'll, I'll keep it short of that. Thanks very much for your efforts. And if those who are present and can got the camera on, would you like to show your appreciation in a normal way, please? And that's all I'm going to say. Keep it quite short. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. That's absolutely wonderful. So um, I think uh, Andrew's already given uh, his uh, little talk about what's uh, coming in the future. So perhaps if anyone uh, wants to talk now um, and give uh, any questions to David, I'm sure he'd be happy to do so. So uh, if you have any questions, could you please uh, state your name and uh, also your location, please. Andrew, could you check the, if there's any questions in the YouTube feed? Hi, David. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. Um, thanks, thanks for that. You, you're talking about the reserves of 15 billion tons. Um, now, presumably, there is a, um, a climate change lobby down there, or is it just open house? I mean, how how do they how do they look at that side of things? I mean, is there any pressure from uh, other bodies throughout the world against against this this climate change lobby? There's a lot of pressure in New Zealand to be green, um, so uh, they are looking at kind of coal gasification techniques. They are looking at uh, carbon capture, uh, but they are kind of one of the reports I've saw was very critical of how successful they would in actually keeping the carbon in the mine, old mine workings. Mm. Um, but certainly a lot of the coal is not accessible by normal mining techniques. Um, I, I took a flight up to one of the glaciers in a helicopter 
and uh, the pilot kind of was telling me that kind of that black rock you can see there um, and it was meters wide you know it's kind of 10 yeah. 15 meters wide that's coal you know, so some of the kind of the coal is just not accessible. Mm -hmm. It's also uh, very similar to the um, potash uh, that Pulby Potash were going for. Mm -hmm. You get lenses of coal uh, because of the, um, oops, the, mm -hmm. you get lenses of coal rather than being kind of a stand, which is why they went for the um, hydro mining technique. It yes. could cope well with but there were sort of quite a lot of issues with the fact that the kind of the mines were very gassy uh, and they, they didn't really fully kind of understand what was happening with the ventilation. Yeah, that, that thanks, David. That, that hydro aspect looked very interesting. It, it, it could do with a paper on its own, I would have thought, and that, those kind of methods, yeah. I, I had a session with, uh, uh, kind of with, it uh, went out to New Zealand to be a mines inspector the mines the head mines inspector uh and it was he introduced this hydro and i'd never heard of it before yeah. so i very quickly kind of added the slide in but as you can see i just got too many slides thank you people should be able to just turn the microphones on by themselves they don't need to have it enabled for them uh david uh, david granger here can you hear me yes go ahead um just comment uh, very interesting uh uh, talk. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to, to New Zealand in 2010, um, which was the year before the Christchurch earthquake, of course. And uh, I, I uh, thought um, Christchurch was a beautiful city. But um, I mean, it, it is a fantastic country, and we spent six weeks uh, touring around. Uh, I can I can you know, recommend it as a as a holiday destination no problem but you know we went to most of the places that uh, you described um and it, it is a fascinating place so uh yeah very very well done and thank you for bringing back all those memories <laughs> thanks thanks for that comment david i uh can't see any questions on the youtube um just everyone saying thank you very much well, I think uh, at that point, I'm sure there is uh, going to be more questions perhaps coming through on YouTube later on. And I'm sure we can log them and uh, address them to David and see, uh, see if you can give a, a decent reply. And I've got to say that I've enjoyed it so much myself. Uh, I, no problem at all with it. listening for a few extra minutes. It's something so interesting. Mm. So uh, all I can say is, as uh, in closing, is uh, thank you very much for everyone for attending. And uh, thank you very much, David. And uh, if Andrew is still there, do you have anything you would like to add before we close down, Andrew? Um, just, I suppose, I can do the... Uh, uh, no, just uh, don't forget, uh, we've got our upcoming events. Um, on Thursday, the 18th of February, we have Rocks That Go Bang, again, by Dr. Helen Hughes. That's going to be fantastic. Um, really interesting for everyone involved in... Uh, how to prevent mining accidents and also geotechnics and then again uh, Thursday the 18th of March living construction and that's um, you know how to create a house uh, out of out of bacteria which would be really interesting as well so uh, that's that's the notices. Thank you very much indeed Andrew. Well I'd say at that point I'm going to say thank you very much for everyone for attending. Uh, keep your eye on the website for any information that's coming up and also keep an eye on uh, program for the future so thank you very much everyone for attending and thank you david thank you david. thanks very much david cheers thank you very much david i thoroughly enjoyed it yeah yeah <clears throat> just wish i'd got a better 